started. <clears throat> All right, so uh, starting in a new unit here as we're moving more and more towards frameworks that allow us to automate simulation, um, kind of starting um, simple with Excel or moving into a, uh, an, um, so in this lab for this week, you're talking about Monte Carlo simulations in Excel. Um, then the next week in lab, we'll be talking about agent-based modeling and NetLogo. And then in the lab after that, that's when we start into ARENA with discrete event system simulation in ARENA. So uh, the uh, homework um, was due, I think Tuesday, but it's still available because there's this 20% per day uh, late policy. So by Sunday, the solution set should be released on Canvas. Uh, there is another ICA opportunity available, and Homework C2 has been available, but it's now formally assigned, I guess, on Thursday, but if you'd like to get started on that, uh, that's fine. Uh, those are two questions related to random number generation. So that will, in order for us to make use of randomness in simulations, like we've started to kind of get a hint at how we might do in these Excel simulations, we need to know how to actually generate and manipulate random numbers. So they aren't just the random numbers that come out of Excel, they're the random numbers that model the world um, using that kind of input modeling framework. And so that's what we've got to learn how to do. And this will be some practice on that um, in that upcoming homework. Uh, so just another reminder, the uh, Rockwell um, Arena competition, entry forms are due end of September, uh, September 30th. Um, see website for details. This is fine if you want to use this as your final project. Uh, there's also FlexSim. I think that's a September 20th deadline for entry. Uh, there's a Simeo one as well that I don't know as much about. So all of these are options that would be fine for your final project. Don't have to do any of these, but if you just want to enter into one of these um, industry-sponsored competitions that has this kind of monetary reward, that is a fine thing to do. Um, so yeah, just reminders about that. So any questions about administrative stuff, policy stuff from in class or online? How am I doing? Uh, I am hanging in there, I guess. Uh, how, how are all you guys doing? Is things okay? Any feedback on the class that anything I'm doing wrong or right that I can do more of or less of that would help you guys? All right, all right, good, good. Online, any feedback? Um, so there's a question online, would it be possible to do a competition uh, for an honors contract uh, as opposed to a final uh, submission? And I, yeah, for those of you interested in honors contracts, if you go to the course information module on Canvas, there's a whole page on honors contracts with some ideas. Um, I would definitely be open for those of you who were interested in doing the competition, but separately from your project, you wanna do the competition as part of an honors submission. I think that would be a really cool idea too. So I am definitely open to that idea as well. Um, I haven't ever had anybody do that because um, it's because it's kind of like, well, I have to kind of do a, a term-like project for one, I may as well just double dip. But if you'd like to do them separately, that's fine too. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm open to discuss that. Anything else online otherwise? All right, great. Anybody catch me like wipe out majorly on Tuesday when I was coming to class? It was like epic, tripped and it was like distance. And me is like destroyed. So, all right, well, I'm glad none of you saw it. Um, all right, so um, where have we been? So last time we introduced the spreadsheet as a little more sophisticated tool for simulation. I said it's um, what we, we do refer to it as a type of programming language. It's a type of declarative programming language. The, um, it captures the relationships between things as opposed to iterating through uh, steps that are constantly modifying state variables. The um, pluses, uh, there's a lot of pros to that. The cons to that for doing dynamic simulations inside these spreadsheets is that because they have no notion of state, well, it's not, they, they aren't built to modify state. So, um, without adding like macros into spreadsheets, it's inconvenient to have complex state variables like lists of customers in line that get modified from row to row to row. And so you can imagine ways you could implement such things, but it just gets kind of hairy 
And so as we saw, and as I'll, I'll go over a second for the MM1 queue here, um, there are clever ways that you can get around um, having to make explicit use of state like you would maybe in another programming language. And so we kind of showed that for your homework B1 example, where rather than iterating over time, we instead, so rather than sort of each row of the spreadsheet being a, an arrive or an event time, we have each row of the spreadsheet being a customer and all of the interesting events associated with each customer are somehow peppered in space across the rows. So every customer has an arrival time, a service begin time, a service end time, um, and those event times can be used to calculate delays, like how long do they wait in the queue, uh, how long do they spend in the system, how long was the, uh, the, the, the server idle. So this is a different way to do a dynamical simulation without actually have to, having to modify state variables at every time step. And so I'm not going to go through all that in detail. I'm happy to answer any questions about that. But basically, you had to think about for every cell, what relationship is always true throughout all of the execution? Kind of like um, if I was describing a, a, a trajectory through space, uh, I can use Newton's uh, laws to generate a differential equation that's true uh, that relates the velocity, acceleration, and position at all times in uh, at, at all times throughout the trajectory. So without actually giving you the whole trajectory or having to worry about uh, modifying something from time step to time step, it's just a relationship that's always true. And that's what we kind of build up here. So you know that the arrival time is always the previous arrival time plus the inter-arrival time. And you can do that with all the rest of these cells. And then you end up populating, and this is like the bonus of that homework, you end up populating a large grid like this where every cell um, is somehow related mostly to the, the cells in its current row and maybe one or two cells from the previous row. And it, um, but there's no, you know, in order to sort of find time, like to follow the time trajectory here, sometimes you have to kind of squint and look around here because like, if I want to know, for example, how many customers departed the system um, by time 15, then I have to kind of think, well, departing the system is when their service ends. Time 15 is between 14 and 18. So three customers departed by time 15. So time is a little more smeared out, but otherwise all the same information is there. So we said that's one way we could do it. Um, and that was for a simple, um, what we're calling an MM1 queue. Um, we'll define what we mean by MM1 if you guys aren't familiar with that in Kindle's notation as we go on, but just a single channel, single server queue. Um, and then we can get, like I said, all the same information here. Now, what I want to show you, to, so what I'm gonna show you today is that for simpler state variables, then there's a way to actually incorporate state into these spreadsheets so that you kind of get the best of both worlds. So some of your logic can be based on things that, that where the state, like here, the state variables are kind of somehow smeared across the spreadsheet. But for simple things like the number of customers currently in a server or whether server A or server B are busy, we can actually incorporate those in as explicit columns. So we can introduce state variables and make the logic more state dependent. And that's what we'll see as we show this for an MM2 queue. Um, but what I'm going to try to motivate here is, although the, all this is possible, it's going to be so much easier when we work in a framework like Arena. And so, um, so that's that's kind of like what you could be doing, and then what you will be doing because it's just so much. Easier. But were there any questions about this example? Um, for those of you who maybe didn't do the bonus uh, or had trouble with the bonus or anything like that, is there anything I can help you with in sort of interpreting how to get? these cells down here to match up with this table that you do by hand up here? Or is that pretty clear? Okay. All right, I'll put up the little question slide there. And by the way, um, you know, this, this like bit.ly questions thing here down at the bottom, if I can get the gyros to cooperate here. Um, that uh, this, this actually is things I did well before COVID. So if any of you are in class, um, you know, have a question but are feeling like you don't want to like volunteer that you have that question, you can also feel free to make use of, 
all of these kind of electronic things. I don't mind if you got your phones out or your computers out or whatever and submit those and I will do my best to uh, monitor them over here. So feel free to make use of those. Okay, so um, that was what we call an MM1 queue. So um, what this, does anybody know that, how many people have taken 470? Anybody? Okay, that's fine. Um, so when you take 470, um, you'll learn about queuing networks and queuing theory applied to these sorts of things. And you'll learn about Kendall's notation. And Kendall's notation basically says for a single channel, single server queue, there's, um, we need to model how often uh, people arrive and how uh, quickly they're served and how many servers there are. And that's what this Kindle's notation is. And what the M means, it stands for Markov or memoryless, or memoryless, is that um, there's an exponential uh, distribution of inter-arrival times. The second M means there's an exponential distribution of service times. And the one means there's one single server. So that's the way we uh, process this. So when you're building queuing networks, you have to, they're sort of networks of servers or service areas. And you have to sort of say for this node of the network, how many servers are there, how fast is the service and how quickly are things arriving um, from the outside world. And that's what's summarized all nicely in Kindle's notation here. So I can go from an MM1 queue to an MM2 queue where now I'm saying that I have a certain um, exponential distribution of inter-arrivals coming in to one single queue, but then that queue um, can, uh, based on some dispatching policy, I can have those at the head of the queue go to server A or server B. So whenever server A is free, for example, I can take someone off the head of the queue. Um, and then if server A is busy and server B becomes free, then I can take someone off the head of the queue. If they're both free, I need some way to decide who gets the one first. So that's what I mean by dispatching policy. So it's a relatively simple embellishment of this queuing node just to add another server um, just hopefully double the time or have the time double the speed it takes me to process these things so i might want to simulate this and i might want to know things like uh well if i do this um is it worth paying for the extra cashier that is you know dealing with this line being fed by this line um so if i find out that they both have 10 percent utilization then maybe I didn't need to double my servers. Maybe I can just go back to one server. So that's something I might want to study in simulation. So uh, they do this in detail in the book, if you want to see uh, more of the detail. But let me just sort of step through, um, you know, roughly, you know, this kind of a, a simplification of what they've done there. So we've got the same sort of spreadsheet we had for our MM1 queue, but now we've incorporated state more explicitly into this declarative framework, into this spreadsheet. So I've got my, uh, um, it's a similar layout where I've got caller number instead of, so they're, they're modeling um, a telephone uh, support system. So instead of customers, it's caller number, but it's the same idea. Every row is not an event. Every row is a caller, a customer, an entity. I've got interrival times, which you can imagine are generated from an exponential distribution. I've got service times for each caller, which you can imagine are generated from an exponential distribution. That's where the M and the M come from. Um, again, it could be EE, -E, but for historical reasons, when instead of saying exponential, we say memoryless or Markovian. And so that's the reason why it's MM. Um, and then, so we need to populate the rest of this, ta this table here. Well, this table's got some new columns. So we've got arrival time, which we're familiar with, but now we've got when server is available. So we're gonna keep track of when able one server or Baker, the other server is next available. At the start, they're both idle. So they're both available. So there's gonna be zero, but we're gonna need to update that to say, all right, when able starts processing someone, we're gonna need to have able cell tell me when they're done processing that person. And that will tell me when able is next free to take someone else on. And, um, and so, I've got when server available, and then related to that, their next service completion time. So we'll see how these columns kind of interplay with each other. Um, and then we've got server chosen. So for this customer, based on their arrival time and when these servers are going to be available, that will tell us which server is going to be, was going to end up serving this particular caller. 
And so that will allow us to process all this down through here. So let's see how that works. The arrival time works exactly like it did before. The next arrival time is always the previous arrival time plus the inter-arrival. No surprise there, hopefully. Um, now, we've got to have some logic here that's now got a little bit more of that conditional if-then stuff that you might expect in an imperative language. And so it's saying here that we're gonna populate this column with Abel or Baker, depending on this when server available condition. And so when, if Abel is, er, is available earlier than Baker, then that means that this customer will end up getting routed to Abel instead of Baker. And that's all it's saying here. So we're gonna say that customer two will get Baker here because when these things get populated, it will be the case that Baker's will be available earlier than Abel. And since customer two is the next customer, then it will go to Baker because Baker will be available sooner than Abel. And so this is kind of a logic will be based on the relative difference between these two columns. It's the way they're doing this. So you end up getting a, a switch between who, which server is chosen. Now we don't how we don't populate. So this in, our, in Excel, this wouldn't um, automatically get filled out. This would be nonsense if, if we started to do it this way. It's only after we fill in all the rest of the sales that, that the cells that this will actually get populated with something. So. Uh, but I'm kind of like, you know, showing you that at the end, this is what it's going to look like. So then what do we know? Uh, well, we know in theory when the service time is going to begin. So at this point, um, we can say, well, we know that the customer arrived and they might have gone directly into a server. If they went directly into a server, then that there is when their service time will begin. Now, what happens if they wait? Well, in order to, to figure out how long they wait for, we can take the minimum of when Abel is available or Baker is available. It's kind of the complement of what we did in server chosen here. Because remember in server chosen, we just said, which one is lower? Well, that's kind of what it's doing here, but it's actually taking the lower value out of this. So we're saying for customer two, their service will begin at the minimum of these two values here. And so that's what we get populated here. Now, if it happens to be, that the servers are available before they arrive, then in that case, the customer is, we take the arrival time, that's what this max is there for. So this is what implements the delay if they happen to arrive before the availability or the no delay if they happen to arrive after the availability. So does this logic make sense so far? Any questions about that? So it's a little bit more exciting. We've got a lot more conditionals, a lot more mins and maxes, a little more nonlinearity involved in there. We're starting to see things switching around from cell, from row to row to row. Yeah. Yes, yes. So when this says when able available, that was my shorthand for the column when server available able. So of course in Excel, these would be populated with cell numbers. So uh, I made the decision to keep it symbolic. Um, otherwise I could have put in like, you know, uh, A, B, C, D across the top and then actually populated these with like Excel or Google Sheets form. But yeah, question? So like April and Baker are time stamps and not like, like they're in. Uh, yes, this right here are the next time when that server will become idle. Any other questions? Looking online. Okay. All right, so that's our first set of logic here. So then um, it's good for us to know um, the completion times. And so we can figure out when Abel's completion time is because we now know um, that uh, whether Abel was chosen in the current row uh, or not. So if, if Abel was not chosen for the current customer, then we just copy down Abel's completion time from the previous customer. But if Abel was chosen to process this customer, we now know more about the future of Abel. We know that Abel's next customer will be this customer. And we know that the Abel's next completion time will be this customer's service begin time plus this customer's service time. Because Abel is the one assigned to that customer. This is, you know, that's why I'm saying if Abel chosen. So for this customer, if Abel's chosen, then 
figure out when able finishes with this customer. That's what this logic is doing. And we're going to have the, comp the sort of the same logic for Baker, but this is going to be flipped so that um, it'll be, and, and I'll just I'll move ahead here. So um, it's the same thing here. So now if able was chosen, then Baker's for this customer, remember this is logic for the caller. So for this caller, if able was chosen, copy Baker's next completion time down because it doesn't change. But if Baker was the one chosen for this caller, then take the caller's service begin time, add the caller's service time, and that will be the next time Baker will complete a service. So Baker might be idle right now, but we're not asking, um, but we're, we're, so we're not, we're, so we're saying, but what's the next time that once Baker starts service, what's the next time Baker will end the service? And that will be the current caller service begin time plus the current caller service time. And that's how we get both of these columns down here. Questions about that? Does that logic make sense? So, yeah. Um, right, so you're saying, so like in the beginning, both are available, right? Uh, right, so that's, that's, an, that's a great question. So, um, so if, if we go back to, it's all, it all hinges on this server chosen column. So if I were to go back to the server chosen here, this less than or equal to breaks that symmetry. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other question? Let me go back to this column here. Oh, there. Any other questions about that logic? So I hope you feel that even though we're not implementing event by event steps, like we did in the hand simulation, the essence of events, activities, delays is all captured in this logic. Okay. And you can see down here, I've kind of even categorized, um, you know, activities, these are the inputs to the system. And then all the kind of event sort of stuff is happening in these like clock columns. And then these outputs are sort of derived from the whole execution. Okay. So then um, now we have enough information to know the next time ABLE is available. Because if we know when ABLE is going to complete, then we also know when ABLE will be available for the next time of processing. So ABLE is available in from, if we look at the previous callers, ABLE's next completion time, that will be the same as the next callers when ABLE available time. So, um, so you can see that this 447712, that just gets copied down. So if I try to highlight here, uh, over here, 44, whoa. This is like I'm doing geometric transformations in my head to try to make this work. All right, so this is like, so here, the 4477121717, that's the 4477121717. It just got shifted down one. So that should make sense. So we had to figure out when ABLE would complete next. And we know that once ABLE is complete, it's ready for a new customer. And so, um, so that's why we just copy it down. So from caller three, we can figure out that ABLE will next be available at time seven. So for caller four, then we know that, um, well, he's gonna be available at time seven. So if caller four arrives early enough, then he's got an opportunity to go in and work with ABLE. But in this particular case, uh, B, uh, Baker was available. So um, caller four will end up getting assigned to Baker instead. But it's just a copy of those two things. So these two columns are just sort of a copy of these two columns. All right, questions about that. And that's all of the dynamical part of the simulation. The rest are just statistics. And that's what the last two columns are. So once we have all of this, we know the execution of this system. We could in theory, leave all the logic in place, paste in new inter-arrival times and new service times. And it would then recalculate the whole thing for us. So we wouldn't have to do any of this, it would just, so we can just do simulations now by just pasting in new inputs, new activities. So this goes along with the input modeling. Um, the inputs to the system are these two activity columns. And if I, in Excel, if I populate these things with random number generators, every time I resave the file or even 
refresh the file, it would redraw these and give me a different execution across the whole table. So that's a way that I can run multiple replications of this experiment. Now, what do I get out of the experiment? The outputs, that's um, over here, like the caller delays, which in this case, for every caller, um, when did their service begin and when did they arrive? That's the delay they had to wait for one of these servers to become available. And um, how long were they in system? Well, for Able, um, then if Able was chosen for this caller, then I look at when Able's next completion was, minus the arrival time. If Baker was chosen for this caller, then I look at Baker's next completion time minus the arrival time. So it's a little, um, it might be a little confusing here because I'm, I, what, it doesn't seem right that I have to refer to Abel and Baker when all I really want to know is how long did this customer stay in the system. But this customer's time in the system, um, we don't know when this customer got out of the system until we actually ask who served this customer and for this customer, when does that when did that service end? So that's the weird thing about this kind of declarative framework here. Since it's not going by time step by time step, then it's kind of like this weird space time continuum thing where for a particular caller, I need to figure out what column corresponds to the right time information. And so in order to get the completion time information out for a particular caller, I need to know what server was chosen for that caller, and then when does when will that server end its service time, which um, is the next completion time for that caller. And so that will end up helping me figure out their time in the system. And that's how I could simulate an MM2, uh, you know, single channel two server queue with uh, a, a platform like Excel or Google Sheets. So any questions about any of that? but how we set up that discrete event system simulation using Excel. So I'm just trickling in state variables here. And what I'm gonna show you as we move forward is ways to get closer and closer to what it looks like our hand simulation for, um, for so for things like uh, inventory management problems, which are like the muffin simulator, those types of problems have a simpler structure or they actually start looking more like your hand simulation. And that's because we can end up coming up with state variables that are not that complicated to keep track of. And so we can end up kind of making something that isn't this weird stretched out space time thing. And so um, for things like inventory management in particular, then things like spreadsheets, can you can actually do pretty powerful dynamic simulations with, which we'll see here in a second. But any questions about this one, this queuing system, queuing node? So like you can do all sorts of analysis on this. When you take 470, you'll start being able to do some mathematics on these where you'll be able to say, if I link together a bunch of these nodes, if I know the average rate that people arrive, then on average, how long do they uh, delay um, without even having to go through all of this? But one of the reasons we go through all of this is because something that 470 won't tell you is what's the maximum amount that anyone might be delayed? What's the minimum amount? Um, what's the mode? These more sophisticated statistics. What's the distribution of inter-arrival times? Is it or of waiting times? Is it bimodal? Um, these are things that are much more difficult to handle with the mathematical frameworks for 470, but come out as long as you run enough of these things and take stats, then they come out very nicely in these simulations. Okay. All right. So um, many types of dynamical systems can be simulated in these spreadsheets. Uh, and actually certain sponsors um, may tell you that they want you to use a spreadsheet. So um, I know people who work with NIH as well as DHS where they have to give up their simulation platform of choice because the deliverables they've been asked for, for NIH or DHS, the only software platform that is approved for that particular unit of the government, um, there's a very limited list and Excel is on that list. So. I know a bunch of people out there who went through undergrad and grad school learning sophisticated computer simulation packages who finally land and uh, you know in, in a sponsored project and they find out that they have to take all of those things that were done for them by an arena, a flex sim or whatever and re-implement them in Excel because um, their favorite platform, flex sim arena or whatever um, hasn't been approved for work inside 
these particular government groups. So I uh, ran a simulation um, summer course uh, for junior students um, over the summer. And uh, we had uh, an official from DHS come in and they asked, uh, you know, one of the people asked, what's one of the tools that you guys could really, would really be useful for you and make you very competitive if you wanted to work in operations research in DHS. And I think the guy's quote was, um, VBA is money. I think he said that. So the idea of using, um, you know, Excel with a maybe a little visual basic scripting on top of it sounds a little archaic. You're like, that sounds like something I would learn decades ago and you would, but it's sometimes your sponsors, that's the only thing they're allowed to work with. And that's one of the reasons why we still are teaching these frameworks. Um, but the downside of these frameworks is that even small changes to the structure, like I showed you that graphical depiction going from an MM1 to an MM2, I just added another server. But it was a major change in the spreadsheet to make that logic work or work. It will work, it will go so much more smoothly in Arena where I change a capacity or I just add another wire and then suddenly I've got another server. So it's a little, it's a pain to implement in this spreadsheet. But there are a bunch of systems that do work well in spreadsheets. I'm going to show a couple of them to you today, and then we're going to leave spreadsheets behind as we move into more sophisticated simulation packages for the rest of the semester. But I definitely just want you to be familiar with, with that there are a lot of cool things you can do with a platform that you might have only thought was used for balancing your budget. So it's not just engineering economics and F over P and P over F and all of that. Okay, any questions or comments? Um, looks like uh, there's some comments online, um, which I think may have been answered by students online. So thank you for those monitoring the chat who ended up uh, doing those clarifications. Are there any other questions? Please feel free to repost, but looks like it's all been resolved. Okay, all right, so, um, let's, um, so inventory management problems. So I want to introduce a couple of these because you're going to do um, inventory management problems in some of your examples and in, in the future labs. Um, and they're just some good things that you should know um, because they're just common models that come up. So you've already seen an inventory management problem. I'll kind of explain that in a second in the muffin simulation. Um, in inventory management problems, they're different than a lot of the queuing theory problems we've seen because events don't occur um, at random intervals. They occur at non-random regular intervals. So normally in an inventory management problem, I worry about my inventory today, tomorrow, the next day. I know the intervals at which I check my inventory and worry about my inventory. Those don't happen at random. But there are other things that happen at random. So um, for example, um, there are um, quantity demanded. So today I know that I've stocked a hundred, um, I don't know, a hundred bags of potato chips, but I have no idea how, what the demand for potato chips will be today, tomorrow, and so on. So I have to make stocking decisions. Do I buy a hundred? Do I buy 50? Um, given that I don't know um, how many potato chips bags we bought today. If I bought a hundred and then I get 40 bags sold in a day, then do I reorder up to 100 or do I wait? Um, because I don't wanna have a big inventory stock left over because that just sits in my warehouse taking up space that could be used for other things. Or um, it maybe makes me have a much bigger warehouse, which means I have to pay more rent for that warehouse when I could have had a smaller one. So um, those of you might be, now we've gone through COVID, you might be more familiar with just-in-time supply chain. Well, until COVID, it was hip, super hip to minimize your inventories down to the bare minimum. And as people made orders, then um, if the demand went up, then you'd rapidly build those things and ship them out. But when we know when people shifted to a lot of work, you know, working from home, then the, you know, the, it upset the whole toilet paper supply chain because of all of these just-in-time triggers where normally they said, well, you know, we, we don't actually produce that much residential toilet paper. And if we do get a slight increase in the need for residential toilet paper, we can just in time expand. And then when they'll get a decrease later and we'll be able to shrink that back down. Well, that didn't work when there was a giant burst to change in traffic. And that's why we had, you know, toilet paper scares, whatever. It wasn't all psychological. So 
that's an example of why there's a, a, there's a pressure to minimize your inventories. And that led to things like just-in-time delivery. So um, we, in our muffin baking simulation, this is an example where you can view this as an inventory management perspective, where the empty oven space is the inventory. How big of an oven do you buy? That relates to how much stock of a particular product do you keep at one particular time? And the arriving muffins are the demand. So it's like a demand for oven space. So if 30 muffins arrive and you only have an oven that's as big for 10, that's like people saying, I wanna buy 30 toasters and you only have 10 on your shelves. So really the muffin sim was an inventory management problem is that um, how much inventory do I provide um, and so on. And there were delays here. So when I wanna order more potato chips, I don't get them immediately. It might take two days for a new potato chip order to get there. Similarly, when I choose to bake muffins, I don't immediately get that muffin space back. It takes three minutes or whatever for the muffin space to become available. So the delays and the random arrivals are two things that we have to deal with in inventory management problems. So generally, inventory carries over as well from one day to another. I had 40 bags of potato chips on Monday. At the end of the day, I'll have 40 bags of potato chips on Tuesday at the start of the day. Um, I might have had 30 units of unmet demand um, from people who wanted something. They maybe gave me money for it, and then it's on back order. So I now owe them that product on Monday, and I still owe them that product on Tuesday. So because of that, the decisions are based on current inventory and current unmet demand, and that is a state. So these are dynamic systems in general. So we do have to keep track of where things were at one point and make you change our decision makings at a future point based on the past. And that's what makes them dynamic. And so they require dynamic simulation models. Now, sometimes we can make modeling assumptions to make it simpler on us so that we can use tools that are much more like the, you know, so 470 is not a very dynamic class. So I like to beat up on 470. Um, and, and so it, it, because uh, just to draw a contrast between the stuff I do here and the stuff I do there, my theoretical background is actually more of a 470 than this class, but I still have to beat up on 470 partly because I feel like I can, like I'm allowed to. Um, and so um, these uh, modeling assumptions can, uh, for example, we can say for at the end of the day, rather than carrying over, any extra inventory I have, I can just charge myself a cost. And I can say, for this particular day, you had 40 more, you know, 40 bags of potato chips. And I could just assume that nobody's gonna wanna buy day old potato chips. So I'm gonna just charge me a cost and restart with hundred bags of potato chips the next day. And charging me a cost from day to day to day prevents me from having to do that carryover. So that effectively, gets rid of the dynamism so that I can turn this into a static problem. And that will make it easier to use mathematical methods or sort of these like spreadsheet-based simulation models. So we're gonna see um, in these two examples, a dynamic inventory management example, and then a static inventory management example. Um, both of them kind of fitting kind of a, a famous, um, you know, model system for thinking about inventory. So for those of you who go out and work on supply chains and inventory management, then you'll likely hear these models referred to as kind of conceptual models for starting points on your inventory management policy. Question. Like a lot of like something we did with operations research. Yes. Like using linear programming. But I don't, I don't see how that's like dynamic. Yeah, so like that's right, well, so the, the, that's what I'm saying. If you can, there are modeling assumptions you can build in that allow mathematical frameworks like LP to be used to better handle these things. So you don't, but there still are LP ways to handle dynamic inventory problems where, but you just have to end up keeping track of, you end up expanding your state space where you might have to see so that tracking traffic of like the inventory of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and how they, and then you have to write expressions for how they all relate to each other. So, you know, the inventory of a week is the sum of the inventory on Monday, Tuesday, et cetera, et cetera. So, Absolutely. Um, these are all like OR type things that you can handle. The, um, the, the stochastic element is something that if you were to handle this in a, a deterministic LP framework, you'd be most likely dealing with means. And um, so what's the mean demand? What's the 
uh, mean lag time, et cetera. And then, you know, and, and that would be fine, but if you really wanna capture the distribution, then you need to know not just the mean demand, but the whole distribution of demand, not just the mean lag time, but the whole distribution of lag time. And you combine those together and you can get a distribution of profits lost or a distribution of, you know, time customer to waited to actually receive their product. So that's the, what we're adding with simulation is the ability to give these distributions, these more uh, fine scale characterizations of outputs. What we're losing is the certainty you get with a linear program where you can say, this is an exact solution. Does that answer your question? Questions online, no. Any other questions? The sort of motivation. All right, so let's, let's give a concrete example here. So this is sort of a very uh, popular inventory management example for a dynamic inventory model. And this is a so-called order up to MN inventory control problem. In lab seven, you're gonna learn about an order up to SS inventory control problem. So this is um, complementary to that. And the idea here is I've got two decision variables that I need to optimize, operations research, I need to optimize these. What is my target inventory level to order up to? And um, that's M. And then N, how often to review inventory model, uh, levels and do the ordering. So got a diagram here that shows over time, there are these um, N uh, time steps. N is a Nancy time steps. And every N time steps, I look at my current inventory and I order enough inventory to bring my inventory back up to M as in Mary, uh, level there. And that's why I get this kind of sawtooth looking thing. So I've got random demand. So between order intervals, sometimes the inventory plummets and sometimes it's very slow. And that's because of my random demand. The demand removes inventory. And I've got random order lead time. So in this model, um, it shows that as you order up to, you immediately replenish your inventory. But in reality, and in the sim cases we're gonna see here, it actually might take some delay so that this would, these would be more like a triangle wave than this kind of sawtooth where you'd have kind of a little bit of a slope this direction and then back down. So, or you might have a delay and then it would come up too. So, so that's kind of the idea, question. Great question. So the negative inventory is when your demand exceeds your current inventory. So this means that there's effectively a back order situation. Now, what does a negative inventory mean to your stakeholder? That might mean that these customers you know, effectively balked and just went away to somebody else, or that might mean that uh, they have committed to getting uh, the order from you, but they aren't gonna pay you. So even though you've got committed customers here, if you want their money, you've got to make sure you get that inventory as soon as possible. So we can penalize negative inventory when we're doing our metrics in order to optimize this. So there, the, you know, what this is, how, the, what this is how, how to handle negative inventory um, is, I would say application specific, but it is a common way to model when uh, demand um, exceeds inventory or supply, when demand exceeds supply. Any other questions about this basic framework here, the order up to inventory problem? How often do I check my inventory and where do I order up? Now, of course, um, you know, if I wasn't, you know, the optimization problem here, I, I could make M really big and make N really small. So every day I check my inventory and I just keep ordering and I always have inventory on hand. But what if the inventory is perishable? Then a lot of that, you know, it's, it's lettuce on the shelves. You know, I can't keep stocking that. Um, what if um, I've got other stuff that I need to stock? I just can't fill my warehouse with lettuce, even if it's lettuce that somehow has a thousand year shelf life. There's other things that I want to sell other than just lettuce. And so I'd really like my M to be small and my N to be large. I got to pay somebody to go out and count all the heads of lettuce. Do I really want them doing that every day? Maybe I can do that once a week. I personally, I do, I do research with ants. Um, so I have ants in my laboratory and I have, to, I have to have somebody come in and feed those ants. Well, I'd like to have them feed once a week. Um, and, uh, and but, you know, so the amount of colonies that I keep is my N and how often they come in to feed them is my N. And I'd like to make N as large as possible and M as small as possible. But 
based on my students research directions, I have to keep an inventory where M is high enough that they can do the work they need whenever it randomly comes up. And I have to keep my N small enough to keep these things alive. So these things apply to a wide range of problems. All right, so any other questions? All right, so, um, uh, so we're gonna move towards a formal model here. Again, this is related to the SS inventory problem you'll see in lab seven and in the last homework of the course. And um, inventory is a state variable. That's the thing that carries over from day to day to day. As I said, N is in Nancy days. Um, that's we, uh, this is a refrigerator sales. So every N is in Nancy days. We order enough refrigerators to bring the inventory, that's our state variable, back to M as in Mary units. But we have a delay and that's a random delay. So even though you've made the order, that order doesn't show up for a couple of days. And each day we have a random customer demand. We don't know how many refrigerators will need to be purchased or will be bought by our customers each day. So lack of inventory leads to back orders, but having too much inventory is costly to store. So those are the kind of the key problems here. So our causal question that we want to try to study with this experiment is how does the M in ordering policy affect the frequency of back orders or lost sales. So we want to get a characterization of for any MN ordering policy, how does, um, how does it affect these outputs? So how do we build such a thing? Well, we have random variables here in terms of the demand and the lead time. So um, this is where input modeling comes into play. And so I'm going to build two input models. I have a model of demand and I'm going to use a discrete probability, uh, a, a discrete random variable here. So the demand, the, this is the daily demand. So that day, how many people, how many refrigerators were ordered from me, not by me, but from me. So how many, how many customers come in and buy a refrigerator that day? And I'm gonna say that there's a 10% chance every day that nobody's gonna want a refrigerator. There's a 25% chance that one and so on. So I've got a little table here and we will learn in the next couple of lectures, given um, and then actually as we move on to after the midterm, um, even more of this, given a discrete random variable like this, how do I actually implement that in a computer so that the demands are consistent with these probability descriptions? And it involves this cumulative column here. I'm not gonna get into that yet. This is just a preview here, but this is a way you would specify an input model. We'd have to confirm that this is actually the distribution of refrigerator orders. You could go to someplace like an appliance store like Best Buy, and you can ask them for sales data and say, how many refrigerators do you sell each day? And they would give you a distribution and it might go from zero to four. And this is the frequency that you'd see that. So that's what we mean by an input model for demand. Another input model is for lead time. How long does it take for the refrigerators I order for the inventory to come into our inventory? And that's also a discrete random variable where normally um, it takes only a day, 60% of the time. Sometimes 30% uh, of the time it takes two days in the rare 10% of the time, um, it takes a whole three days for us to get those refrigerators. And so we have to put this into the system as well. So that every time I rerun my spreadsheet, it draws every day um, a different demand and every time I order a different lead time. So does this make sense? These two input models, an input model for demand and an input model for lead time. I get these from data before I run my SIM. Questions online, looks good. Okay, all right, so now I can implement my SIM. I'm not gonna go through all of the steps here for all these formulas. If you're interested in that, this is just um, in section two, four of your textbook. You can find out all of that sort of stuff. I, I do, I will, I guess, highlight, maybe I'll use, um, use the mouse here. It might be a little easier to see, um, but um, some things that I wanna notice here um, is they've now got state columns up here. So I've got, State, 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 state. So um, the, I'm, I'm making the, um, and also the rows here are now in, in terms of time. So not, I'm not modeling the customers as they come in. I actually am modeling each day. So this is very similar to your muffin simulation. And so through here, I can say, well, at any particular day, um, I can look at what is my current inventory at the beginning of that day. So three, 
Uh, so maybe I'll point with the mouse here for those online. So the, the beginning inventory at the beginning of that day was three, but then I had two customers come in and order a refrigerator. So at the end of the day, that state variable is now equal to one. I had no shortages. I had enough to sell to those customers. Um, but um, on the previous day, if I look at the previous day, my ending inventory was three, but my order up to policy says that I always wanted to keep 11 refrigerators on hand. So that 11 up there um, is gonna mean that on that day, when I did the inventory check, I ordered eight refrigerators. Now, when I made that order for eight refrigerators, which is shown here, which is that previous day, I drew a random lead time and it happened to come up to be two. So that means that I had to have a column which is keeping track of how many days of lead time are left. And so in Excel, it's just counting down. And while it's counting down, I still have that pending order quantity. That's how many orders are standing out there just waiting to be delivered. And so I don't actually get those inventory until this time after it, where if I look at the um, beginning inventory on this day down here, day three, it goes up to eight. So this is an example where I started with an inventory of three. I had several customers come in and my inventory actually hit zero and it didn't finally go up to eight until several days later. And, um, and, and fortunately I didn't have any shortages, but if I would have waited until I was down to zero and then ordered 11 refrigerators, then I would have had shortages because I've got all this demand that's coming in continuously. So again, I'm not gonna go through all of the formulas here, but I hope you're seeing as just sort of an, an abstract case here that we could potentially build logic that keeps track of this inventory state variable, but because it's kind of a spreadsheet, that state gets kind of spread across the time rows where I have to keep track of what's the beginning value of the state variable, what's the ending value of the state variable. And then if I wanna keep track of delays, then I've got to keep introduce these sort of artificial state variables, which were like days until order arrives. So that's a state variable that normally in our mind, when we explain to the stakeholder, the stakeholder is going to understand that inventory is a state variable. But in order to make this work in Excel, I need an additional state variable, which is keeping track of how much delay is currently being unrolled. So I introduced that state variable there. And then I can end up getting rid of going through all this. And now I've got a distribution of ending inventories here. I've got a distribution of shortage quantities. I can take averages at the end here. So 69 is the sum of this whole column divided by the 20 or the 40 uh, or the other uh, 25 days. And that gives me an average of 2.76. So my inventory every day was an average of 2.76 and my shortage quantity every day was an average of half a refrigerator. So that's how I get that. Are there questions about this basic structure? Again, I could, um, I could go through the formulas that you would use for each cell. I don't wanna go through that, uh, all of that detail, but I want at least to give you sort of a season um, of uh, to sort of to feel how you could implement things like delays in these inventory management problems that are dynamic like this. Does this make sense? Any questions online as well? So this delay part is kind of one of these, these new things that we've really added very different than the Abel and Baker stuff that we did with a call center thing. And this spreading the inventory out so that it, so it, it kind of works with demand is kind of also a, a new thing here. So in principle, these things can be done in a spreadsheet. It's kind of a headache to do them in a spreadsheet. Um, and um, uh, compared to what you'll see um, the relatively simple flow that we'll see in lab seven as we do inventory management in the arena. Now, what do you get when you get out of this? Well, as I mentioned, in one experimental replication, this is one sample, one experiment here, we got an answer of a 2.6 is our average delay. If I, re, if I opened Excel up and I ran this you know, 400 times, I opened Excel 400 times, I refreshed the page 400 times, or I used a VBA script, to, re to just reinitialize this spreadsheet 400 times and grab 400 of these numbers, I could then generate a histogram like this one. And so this histogram is that average daily inventory over 
400 runs of that spreadsheet. And I can see here that although the ending inventory is pretty darn variable, the average inventory sticks around that 2.76 across all those 400 runs. And, um, and so that gives me a better characterization of, you know, over the many different universes we could live in, um, there are some universes where the average inventory is one, there's some universes where it's as high as 5.5, but in most universes that I ran this system in, it was around 2.76 or so. And um, fortunately, negatives didn't occur at all. And, um, and there weren't huge um, inventory surpluses either. So maybe this is a good uh, outcome. Now you can imagine rerunning this, this is for 11. So this is for an M of 11, and I think an N of one. Um, and so I could change those. So I could make it an, uh, an MN of um, you know, 40 and an N of five, and then see what this histogram looks like. And so we can now evaluate our decision variables in terms of these histograms, which are a much richer source of information than just an average. All right, any questions about that? Does that make sense of how we can use these inventory management problems in this way? All right, so let's look at a simpler example, a static case of inventory management. So this is the classic news vendor model, which is also known as the single period model or the perishable model. This is the case where the mathematicians got involved in inventory management and came up with some clever simplifying assumptions and found a wide range of systems where those assumptions work. And so as before, we have an uncertain demand every day, but we're going to um, fix the prices so that the cost of me buying the item uh, and putting it in inventory is fixed over time. And the cost of somebody buying the item for me, um, you know, for me selling the item, that's also fixed over time. The cool assumption they've added is what if it's perishable? So what if it is that head of lettuce or in this case, a newspaper? The assumption here is newspapers at the end of a day for a news vendor are worthless. They have zero value whatsoever. And so you automatically lose them. This clever little assumption of a perishable product means that for this inventory management problem, there's no state, there's no carryover from day to day. I can evaluate how well I did that day in terms of how many newspapers or heads of lettuce were left over because I assume that I lost all of that. Like I had to buy those but I didn't, nobody bought them from me. So I couldn't recoup the cost of buying them. I couldn't make anything. So I can, I can evaluate my profit at the end of every day and accumulate profit over a bunch of days, but there's no state. There's, no, there's nothing that's transferring from day to day to day. There's no inventory I have to keep track of from day to day to day. And so the kind of lazy mathematical way to solve this is to say, well, my average profit is just going to be the, average value of, um, so again, remember demand is a random variable. So that's where the averages come into play here. So I can imagine that for any demand distribution, I can generate a new random variable, which is the minimum of my inventory level. That's, a, that's my decision variable, I assume that's constant. And so that generates a random variable, multiply that by a constant value, that generates a random variable and I can take an expectation over it. And, um, and then I can subtract off this constant here. So this here is the mathematical expression that in theory, so long as the distribution for demand is something reasonable, like a normal distribution or something, I can look up how to actually generate a mathematical expression for this, for expected profit, and then take a little partial derivative. The, the, you know, the partial expected profit over the partial inventory, set that thing equal to zero, solve for the inventory that maximizes profit, and Bob's your uncle, I'm done. So. I now have how much inventory I stock each day to maximize that, that demand. That's the kind of standard way that uh, you might solve this uh, news vendor problem. The downside to that is it's focused just on average performance. What if I care about um, what is the maximum profit I get each day? What is the minimum profit? Are there any days where I actually lose money? Like that's, those are maybe questions that my stakeholder might ask me. So how do I deal with that? So we'll build a little spreadsheet. In this case, the only um, input that I'm worried about is the demand input. There's no uh, lag time that I have to worry about. Um, that would be kind of crazy if like newspapers had a lag time, but you could imagine with heads of lettuce, there would be maybe an order uh, lead time, sorry, that you have to worry about. 
So this input model, I've got my, it's just, um, is it a good day, a fair day, or a poor day? And so we can define what good, fair, and poor mean, but we're saying that most days are fair, some days are good, and then uh, there's the rare day that's bad. And each one of these corresponds to how many newspapers I would sell that day. So I've got my distribution here that Excel will draw this column randomly. And each type of news day corresponds to a particular demand. Fair days are 50, um, or fair days tend to be 50. So there can be a random uh, relationship with these. So you can think of fair, um, like this demand here is itself a random variable. And the mean of that variable can actually be um, related to fair, good, and poor. So these two columns you can think of as random variables here, which are drawn by Excel. If I know the demand, and if I also know that I bought 70 newspapers at the beginning of every day, then every day I can calculate my profit for that day. And the profit for one day is unrelated to the profit for the next day. So over 20 days, I can just calculate my total profit. And there's no, it, it, this isn't a dynamic simulation. This is really just a simulation of 20 independent days that I'm aggregating together to sort of understand that, well, even if one day is bad, maybe the next day will be good. So that over um, a little more than a month, um, how much money do I get? And that's what I'm simulating here. And with that, I can take this thing and I can run this whole spreadsheet a hundred times. And that generates a hundred total profits. And that will generate this histogram right here, where I've got, I can see here that in some universes over 40 days, I only make whatever 85 bucks after 40 days. In other universes, I make over 200 bucks in 40 days. But in most universes, I make roughly whatever this ends up being, probably about, um, yeah, 100, well, maybe a little more than that, maybe 150 bucks. So this is the type of information here. And if I change, my decision variable, the number of newspapers that I stock um, each day, then um, this distribution will change. And so if somebody doesn't like this distribution, then you could explore, well, if we, let's try a couple different, we'll do, we'll stock five newspapers, 10 newspapers, 100 newspapers, 1,000 newspapers, and we'll look at the distribution for each of those decision variables. And then we can make a choice over the distributions we get out of how we should stock the newspaper. So that's the simulated version of the newspaper problem. Any questions on that? Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, profit here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the way they've there's two random variables involved here where the demand as a numerical distribution has some parameter like uh, mean. And so the type of news day here is gonna affect that parameter. So it's still possible on a, a, a good news day to just be unlucky that it, like, a lot of people, this is saying like, some people have a really had an appetite for news that day. Now, people can have a real appetite for news, but you could have just been on a bad corner that day. Like this is kind of like the extra, extra, read all about it type news vendor problems. And so the idea is there, even though that the, um, there was an appetite for news, the demand for news was high, you just got unlucky on that particular day. And whereas everyone else might've got a hundred, you were getting 40. So there's a bunch of tails that we have to worry about in simulation. So in 470, you worry about the means, you worry about the middle of the distribution, in 475, we were at the tails of the distribution and the shape of the distribution. And so even though the average performance, which is what we usually communicate to people, how well things are in average, the width of that distribution can make a major difference in operations. And that's what we try to capture in the simulation. So any other questions about that? The classic news vendor problem or perishable problem, single period problem. And the other thing I'm just highlighting is the cleverness in the modeling assumption they made that prevented having to use a dynamical model for this and then finding systems where that assumption would be met. Okay. All right. So the last thing that um, I want to give a, a brief breeze through because you'll get this more in detail in lab three is Monte Carlo simulations. 
Very common thing you'll work, work with in Excel spreadsheets. Um, if you're doing risk analysis, it's gonna come up in there. There are lots of definitions of what the heck a Monte Carlo method or Monte Carlo simulation is. Um, the most common one you'll find is a simulation like this, a stochastic simulation approach that uses random sampling to precisely estimate a quantity impractical to calculate exactly. So normally, um, th this is actually fits into numerical methods. It's like, I've actually written out a weird double integral. And in theory, I could take this double integral and find a way to solve it, you know, integrate under these, this area here. But it's really hard to do that, or it might just be impractical to do that, where um, I just, there's no, we have no mathematical trick to actually allow us to solve it. We know that a solution may exist, and we have the formula for the double integral, but we don't know how to do the double integral. Well, this is a way of using simulation to randomly sample from mathematical expressions to then create an estimate of that. So the first thing that you'll do in lab three is you're gonna estimate pi using random sampling. So rather than using geometry or anything like that, you're gonna throw darts at a dartboard and where those darts land on the dartboard, you're gonna have a way to aggregate all those things to actually give you the value of pi to arbitrary precision. So, um, so that's the math magic of Monte Carlo simulations. Here, I'm gonna couch them into the books examples, which bring them into kind of a simulation context. But just as the warning that when a lot of people talk about Monte Carlo simulations, they're not actually thinking of a simulation of a real world system. They're talking about using simulation methods to make numerics easier. So as an example, let's say I've got 10 bombs loaded onto a plane and I can drop them on an area and I wanna know What's the distribution of the number of bombs that lands in that area? Well, this is a mathematical problem. We could solve this in theory with pen and paper. We can draw the area out and it might be some funny area. And if we know the spatial distribution for each one of these bombs, then in theory, we could use our mathematical smarts, again, like a double integral, this is like two dimensions there, to figure out how much, how many of these will actually land in this area here? We could do that mathematically in theory. It'd be a pain and it might actually be impossible. So it, it, it might be in theory, you could write the problem out mathematically, but it might actually be impossible to write the solution out analytically. So how do we actually get an estimate of this? Well, we can use Monte Carlo simulations for that. So what we do is we um, open up a spreadsheet and in each row of the spreadsheet, I'm gonna call that a run or a sample, then I generate 20 numbers. So 10 coordinates, 10 X, Y coordinates, where each X is maybe drawn from a random distribution from zero to, you know, from one edge of the, the, the boundary to the other. So each, you know, it might go from negative 1200 to 1200. Each Y might go from negative 800 to 800. So I can generate 10 X's and 10 Y's in each row. And then I can ask for the 10 X's and 10 Y's that I just uh, um, drew, how many X, Y pairs actually landed inside this box? So long as I have a way inside the spreadsheet to quickly calculate give for a given X and a given Y, did it fall inside this box? So it might be a pain to, to write that out, but I could count of those 10, how many landed in that. And so for that row, I will get an answer to this problem. You've got six landed inside the area, four out, six in. And so I can then generate thousands of these samples. So thousands of these hypothetical bombing runs. And then that for each one of them, they'll have a number that we're in and a number that we're out. And then I can estimate the answer to this distribution question from those 1,000 samples or 10,000 samples or whatever. The more samples I generate, the more precise of an answer I get to this distribution question or this probability question. All right, that, that makes sense. This like bombing example, this is almost identical to the example you'll do when you estimate pi, but it'll be like throwing darts at a dartboard and whether the darts land in a particular part of the dart, dartboard will actually give you an, an estimate of what the value of pi is. Now there's um, some other examples. I'm not gonna go through uh, this one here, this reliability problem. I encourage you to take a look at it in your book, section two five, but it's a way to um, estimate for different 
um, for different ways of replacing ball bearings in a machine, um, what's sort of the best way in terms of how long the machine is down and how much uh, and how long the, the machine lives. Um, but the one that I do want to take a quick second about this is something that you'll do in the bottom half of lab three, and that's this so-called stochastic activity network. And so the setup for this one is imagine you're doing an activity that has three parallel uh, sub-activities, subtasks. So breakfast is one example. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, if you're a person who eats, um, you know, eggs and meat, then you might have eggs, toast, and bacon. Um, eggs may take multiple steps to make. Toast might take only two steps to make, and the bacon only takes one step to make. The whole breakfast is ready only when all of these things are done. Now, it might just be that if um, the, the, the steps that take the, the average time for each one of these branches might all be the same. So in this case, the average time here is nine minutes on the bottom branch. That's the uniform distribution between six and 12. But the average time here is also nine minutes because this task here, it takes four and a half minutes. And this task here on average takes four and a half minutes. This task takes three minutes on average, three minutes on average, three minutes on average. So they all take nine minutes on each path. So you might imagine that the average time for the whole breakfast to be done to be nine minutes but it won't be. And we could figure out why mathematically, we could in theory write down a mathematical expression for the distribution of this whole statistical plastic activity network. In fact, we can write down a mathematical expression for the top side and for the bottom. For the bottom is a uniform distribution. We know how to write that. The top one is the sum of three uniform distributions. You all know what the central limit theorem is, hopefully from 380 or 385. The central limit theorem says if you add up three independent things, that sum will tend to approach a normal distribution. Well, you add up three uniform distributions, and instead of being a fat distribution, you get something that looks more like a bell curve, as expected. And so we know the bell curve shape on the top here. We know this one here. The question is, how do we take the maximum of all three of these and understand the distribution of that? And that might be a very difficult mathematical problem to solve. So instead, we just simulate this system and we look at this distribution that comes out of that. And I don't want to give away any punchlines that you're gonna find with your lab three activity, but I will give a hint that the, the fact that the bottom distribution has equal probability for all times between six and 12, but the top distribution is very rarely six and very rarely 12 because it relies on these three things, the kind of these, the sequence of events, then that is what's going to skew things so that you might think that the, that the critical path, the one that takes the longest is equally likely to be either of these three paths. But in reality, um, you, might, that you might, after looking at this, maybe get the hint that maybe the lower path is more often going to take longer because it has significant probability stuck here near 12 minutes whereas the upper path, most of its probability shifted down beneath like say 10 minutes. So those are the sorts of things that add real complications that are difficult to characterize mathematically, but we can build a spreadsheet where we'll draw six independent random variables, which are the six variables shown here, one, two, three, four, five, six. And from those six variables that you'll draw on each row, you'll be able to, similar to the bombing problem, ask which path took the longest and that path determines the length of breakfast. So what's the distribution of breakfast? And that is what you'll end up doing in your lab. All right. So, um, so the rest of this stuff is mainly me waxing philosophically about why despite the value of spreadsheets, they, um, for complex problems where we need to reconfigure things rapidly, we don't have time to build things in spreadsheets. That's why we use these other tools. So not a whole lot of extra and quantitative stuff there. So let me give you the attendance question and then I'm happy to take questions and that's all I've got for you today. So just this attendance question and that will be, um, let's say the question is, ah, uh, um, in the central limit theorem, when you add up a bunch of independent random variables, what tends, to be the distribution of their sum. 
So add up a bunch of independent variables and then look at the distribution of their sum together over many, many sums, you get a distribution of sums and what does that distribution tend to look like based on the central limit theorem. And that's all I've got for you today. Again, happy to take questions if you got them. Otherwise, if you don't, feel free to take off. Um, and uh, I will retype that question in the chat. Otherwise, have a good weekend and see you next week. Uh -huh. Sure, let me just end the recording here and then. Uh...